This is McLeod Insights, where we feature conversations with longtime transportation industry veterans who are now team members at McLeod Software. Our goal is to support and empower our customers by helping them learn about proven ideas and best practices that will have a positive impact on how they run their companies. Let's dive in. Hello, and welcome to McLeod Insights. I'm Robert Bowen, McLeod's Director of Product Marketing. Today's broadcast is a conversation from McLeod's recent user conference and features our customer, Mark Reed, President and CFO of Reed TMS. Mark was interviewed by Josh Fisher of Fleet Owner Magazine. In this conversation, you'll learn how Reed TMS adapted to the COVID crisis Mark and Josh discussed the role software and people play in their company's growth and profitability. Mark shares how they handle driver retention and gaps when pricing freight. They also discussed the challenging future for the trucking industry. We hope you enjoy the broadcast. Hi, everybody. Welcome. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Uh, my name is Josh Fisher. I'm a senior editor at Fleet Owner Magazine. Uh, and I'm excited to be joined here by Mark Reed, who's the president and CFO of Reed TMS Logistics, a uh, position Mark took over 12 years ago. Uh, in that time, he's helped grow uh, the company from a $24 million brokerage with 20 employees, and now they're over $300 million asset-based 3PL company with more than 350 full-time employees. Reed offers full truckload, uh, LT, uh, LTL, LT, less than truckload, freight management, and uh, dedicated services uh, with locations in five states. So, uh, Mark, thanks for joining me today. Glad to be here. Um, let's just get started right away and maybe give us a little bit of background on your operations, how you've grown so much uh, since you took over. Sure. So, um, we, we started out as a brokerage. My dad started the company in 1996. Um, we, uh, we acquired TMS Logistics, the asset company, in 2010. We decided uh, that we wanted to differentiate from a lot of the brokers out there and be able to bring assets to the table. Uh, and, and I think it was, a, it was something that also helped um, grow the brokerage and at the same time support the assets. So the, the two businesses really complement each other very well. That's great. So, But walk us through the past year and a half. I'm sure with having... Um the two different sides of the company. How did how did how did that how did they affect each other? How did you guys uh, weather this storm that we've all been battling? Yeah, so <clears throat> we've been growing the the brokerage side and the asset side pretty tr pretty dramatically over the last several years, and um, our uh, the growth on the brokerage side has been explosive growth. But it was a lot of we were taking on a lot of new contracted business um, when when we went through the pandemic and the downturn that happened in March, um, it, it was really a tale of two businesses. We saw a big drop off in revenue for the brokerage and the assets, but obviously the cost to hire uh, on the brokerage side went down pretty dramatically right after that shutdown occurred. So we were able to maintain, whereas the assets were impacted very negatively. Uh, then all of a sudden the assets started making a comeback. And what we saw towards the end of the year is the brokerage got hammered. They had a bunch of we had a bunch of contracted business. The rates, the cost to hire started to go through the roof, and the brokerage took a, a bunch of hits. So we had to make a lot of changes and really kind of get the company refocused coming through the pandemic. And I'd say the biggest thing that we uh, did is we created our ten commandments of uh, profitable growth uh, that came out of the that came out of the pandemic because I think we were growing for the sake of growing in a lot of cases, and we wanted to get away from that and really focus on profitable growth. Can you tell us a little bit more about these Ten Commandments and how uh, you've developed them and what how your company's bought into them? Sure. I mean, uh, to, I'll pick out a couple of the key ones. Uh, obviously, what we've done historically on, a, on the back of a napkin, anytime we're making any significant investments in people, headcount, whatever, you know, we always thought about what, are, what does the return on investment look like? Uh, we've formalized that process, so any investment in a new customer, any investment in technology, any investment in people above a certain limit requires a process that we have to go through to validate that. And then the other thing we've done is we, we've built what we, uh, what we call an, a contribution margin model for both the brokerage and the assets. It's, it's built at the customer level. 
we build that contribution margin model, and we look at the profitability of each customer at that contribution margin level. Uh, and when we talk about a new customer investment, uh, we, we will make a determination early on how much are we willing to invest in that, in that customer at the contribution margin level, and we'll actually communicate that level in, of investment to the customer. So if we take on a bunch of lanes and we start losing money on those lanes, the customer is going to know about it, and when we get to that limit for a month or a quarter or whatever it might be, we will halt the, uh, the, the acceptance of freight until we can figure out a way to turn that profitability around. And you know, we look at that at the customer level as a whole, so we kind of use that as a guide to say, hey, it's time to go back to the customer. If we're going to lose money on these lanes, we're willing to lose money on these lanes, but only if they're going to give us lanes that are going to be more profitable elsewhere. Yesterday morning, Tom McLeod talked about now being a good opportunity to take a look at your customers uh, and reassess everything. It sounds like you've been doing that. What's been the feedback from, uh, from your customers? You know, um, I think Tom hit the nail on the head. We, it, we were forced to go back. I, I'll tell you guys a little story, and it's almost embarrassing. But when we did our first uh, uh, prof, uh, contribution margin model for our customers, we looked back over a, a, an eight-month period through August of 2020, and it was embarrassing that 40% of our customers were losing money at the contribution margin level. And it, when you looked at that, you sat there and said, no wonder – we're struggling. So I agree with what Tom has said. And, you know, I think what we've been able to do by creating this is we now have a team that instead of just focusing on margin dollars, and this is primarily on the, on the brokerage side of the house, instead of just focusing on margin dollars and margin growth or margin percentage, we're going back to the customers now saying, look, this is where I have to be on a per file basis to make money on your account. And so we're talking to our customers about that. And, but more importantly, we've got people educated. The other thing that we're doing, so right now we've created visibility with our sales team. So they're aware of that contribution margin model. We're going to start rolling that contribution margin uh, model into their compensation plans in 2022. We decided not to do that for 21 because we didn't want to disrupt uh, 25 years of, you know, margin growth as, as the target, but we're going to be rolling that into as a portion of their uh, compensation plans in 2022. How do you go about doing that when you have, you change something you've been doing for 25 years? How do you get your sales staff to buy into that and uh, get together and, and accept that? Was, was there pushback? Is there, were they excited about it? I, I would say that it's all about the numbers. It's all about metrics. And, you know, I think our people, by, by opening their eyes to what does it cost us to service an account as opposed to just getting paid on margin, um, I think when they see what it costs to service the account and how we've created the model to make that happen, uh, they buy into it pretty quick because they know, I mean, let's face it, I, I think we can all probably say the pandemic was uh, a lot of restless nights during that pandemic. And um, especially coming off of a year and a half of, you know, heavy growth, but not great profitability. Uh, it was it was painful, and uh, we decided we want we don't want to go back there again. Right. Let's take a uh, let's look at the asset side some, and I'm just curious about how, um, particularly now with the the equipment shortages out there, have you changed any sort of uh, replacement cycles? Are you are you worried about that? Has that affected the business at all? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think it's had a I think it's had a big impact. Uh, we have actually shifted gears pretty dramatically with uh, trailers in particular. Uh, we've got about 100. Well, we're on about 120 trucks and about 750 trailers in our fleet. Uh, a lot of those are on bigger dedicated accounts. And I would say the the two things that we've done is we've we've gone to we lease we historically have leased our power and and purchased the assets. Uh, we just don't think there's a way to make a lot of money on assets on power. We think trailers are a great long-term investment. Mm -hmm. So uh, what we've done is uh, we've gone to our leasing partners on the asset side or on the, on the power side, and we've looked for some shorter-term lease options, you know, units coming off lease, things like that, so we can make some better decisions and, not, and also not buy the higher-priced units because everybody's jacking up 
pricing. I mean, we've seen trailer new trailer buys going up 40%, mm-hmm. which is unbelievable in a, in a short period of time. On the trailer side, we've, we've kind of used the relationship that we've had with our uh, rental companies to expand the fleet because we can't get them from our OEM right now. They won't even quote us. So we've gone to our uh, trailer rental companies who we've been doing business with over the years, but it's usually small pieces here, small pieces there. We've actually committed to about 200 trailers with them over the next uh, three to four years. So we feel like that three to four years is going to be our stopgap for uh, being able to get uh, fair price new equipment from our OEM. Hmm. Let's talk about um, the drivers some now. You've obviously, the company's really grown a lot over the past uh, 10 years. Um, has that pandemic, um, how have you dealt with the drivers through, through, through the pandemic? Um, and are you finding it, it's, it, are you finding it harder or easier to, re, to retain the, the good drivers that you have? Um, I think it's getting harder. Um, what we've seen is um, a lot of turnover, I think in large part because we have drivers that are, uh, that are chasing signing bonuses that have become you know, much more prevalent in the marketplace. Um, the, uh, you know, obviously, yeah, I've been in several of the sessions that talk about driver hiring and recruiting and retention. And I mean, we all know the keys to the castle are, you know, finding the right guys, treating them well, uh, you know, doing the things that we need to do and then paying them fairly for what they do. And I think we pay guys very fairly, uh, but we also are a little bit conservative when it comes to paying drivers because we know, I think it was said best in one of the sessions the other day, once the tube's out of the toothpaste, it's not going back in. So you got to be cautious about not going overboard. So uh, what we've uh, one of the things we've done just recently uh, to really focus on retention is we put in place a, uh, a stay bonus. And we felt like going to our guys and saying, look, everyone that's been here a year, we're going to give you a stay bonus. We structured it as a note. So basically what means we're going to give you a check up front. If you stay for a year, we're going to forgive that note. So it's a, it's basically a note. We're going to forgive it, and we're going to pay the taxes. And please don't tell the IRS that I'm doing that because that, I know that's probably not legal. But um, so we put in place a stay bonus to try to stop our, our guys that have been with us for a year or longer from chasing these signing bonuses all over the place. The other thing that we've done is uh, I'd say 75% of what we do is, is uh, hourly driver pay. Uh, we've got about uh, 20% of our fleet that runs over the road. The rest of it's uh, short haul and dedicated, so they're hourly drivers. So we adjusted our base pay package uh, up by two bucks an hour going into uh, 2021 uh, as a as an impact of the pandemic. We were just seeing it, and then we just literally, as part of Driver Appreciation Week, uh, rolled out our new pay packages, and it's going to have a net impact of about two. Two to 250 an hour on our hourly drivers. But what we did is we ramped up the pay packages, kept the base pay the same because we're recruiting guys at the base rates that we have, but we ramped up the pay package. We used to have a bottom to top uh, pay increase of about 250, three bucks uh, an hour. So an eight or 10 year guy was making $3 an hour more than the, than the, br- the brand new guy. Uh, we've just changed that to encourage people to stay on board. So we've taken that now from three bucks an hour to six bucks an hour. So some of our higher and longer tenured guys are getting bigger increases, um, and we think that's going to help with uh, the retention side of things. What was the initial feedback you got? It's been uh, it's been gangbusters. Yeah. I mean, um, of course, I've been here. I wish my the, the planning on this was tough because I'm not not with our drivers this week, but. Um, um, the, the, uh, the, the team rolled it out this week. You know, we're having small group meetings with all the drivers as they come in, and it's been, uh, it's been really amazing. I've, I've gotten a bunch of uh, feedback from the team as they've rolled it out. Very, very positive feedback from, uh, from the driver group. And um, so I, I, th- I hope that's going to be the right thing. And I think it will also encourage people to, to stick around. You know, we, we got that $6 an hour increase, but we're front-end loading that increase. So... Uh, the four of the six dollars comes in the first four years uh, of their of their time with us. So I think it'll encourage guys because we usually 
have a tendency to lose those guys usually within six months or a year. With that extra comp coming in, I think we'll, it'll help stem that a little bit. Yeah. You know? So another topic that really has come out today um, that's big right now is, is vaccinations. And I've been asking various carriers about this, and I know it's sometimes a touchy subject for, for some people, and the ATA just came out yesterday uh, against this. Do you guys have a policy? And I'm just curious on how um, – are you encouraging vaccinations for, for COVID among your drivers and staff, or is that a hands-off approach? Um, well, we, um, we've been really significantly impacted by COVID. Um, I would say over the last three months um, – We've, we've probably had 10 non-driving personnel out at any given time and, and 10 driving personnel out at any given time. Uh, so it's, it's been a big impact. It has a huge impact on revenue. At the end of the day, you know, we've talked about it a lot. We've talked about making it mandatory. Um, we, we encourage everybody to get vaccinated, but I also feel like uh, we, we need to let our employees make their own decisions. Um, and so we haven't gone down that path to mandate it. Uh, what we have done is uh, is we've given people the time that they need in terms of paid time off. So if if they want to if they want to go get vaccinated and they need to take a half a day to do that, you know we'll give them the time to get it done, and not not count it as uh, just absent time. Uh, but other than that, uh, we're we're just encouraging it. We've done a survey of our entire team, uh, driving and non-driving personnel. We've got a, a pretty good response from everybody in terms of uh, the percentage of people that uh, took the survey. And we're at about 60% vaccinated right now, which I felt like was, uh, was a pretty good number. Mm -hmm. uh, and I didn't feel like there was any need to really keep, you know, keep pushing it further than that. The other thing we've done is that for those that are not vaccinated, we've asked them to wear masks when they're not at their desk, just to try to be precautionary. What's been the reaction? Um, everybody's complying for the most part. Uh, I, you know, I don't think, uh, I don't think the people that aren't vaccinated love the fact that they have to wear masks. But, right. You know, I think they also understand that, uh, that's part of the, they could get vaccinated if they want to. So I guess maybe we're pushing a few buttons without, mm -hmm. without, uh, completely going right. over the top and saying you must be mandate, uh, ma uh, mandate the vaccination. Do you, um, just not necessarily for, for your company, but overall, um, do you worry about a vaccination mandate hurting the supply chain uh, across the nation? That's what uh, the American Trucking Association is worried about in, in what they said yesterday. Um, you know, yeah. that's a, I just hope what uh, uh, Mr. Broughton talked about yesterday is accurate. So uh, I think we're going to continue to see supply ch chain disruptions. And um, I mean, this COVID thing isn't, isn't going anywhere anytime soon. So uh, I just hope what he talked about yesterday is real. Yeah. I mean, I'd love to see a, a five to 10 year run just in time for me to retire. That'd be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't we all? <laughs> um, so I'm interested also in uh, you. We, when we talked before this, you mentioned you've seen some of the some lanes uh, really jump up in pricing. And maybe I just think maybe some people here would be interested in uh, what what your city, like for example, like Central Florida to Atlanta. You, yeah. what, you've, like, what, what, what are some areas where you've really seen it just pop up? Well, you know, uh, that, that's, that's, a, that's a funny story, but I, uh, I'm not actively involved in pricing, but I'm, I'm kind of aware. I, I just call it aware of pricing. And so I, it's funny because I send some uh, pricing over to our pricing team at times, and then they send me back the pricing, and I'm like, you guys are crazy. What the hell's going on here? And I, I told uh, Josh's story about the, um, the, the lane from Central Florida. So Atlanta to, to – Central Florida to Atlanta is probably one of the most beat down trucking lanes in the history of the country, right? I mean, for the life that I've been in the business and even when we started, it was like a $350, $400 lane. And up until, you know, maybe last fall, it was a $350, $400 lane. I mean, it's 25 years and it's been the same rate for, for 25 years. I mean, how the hell does this happen? And uh, when we started pricing stuff and we started seeing things, where the, the rate from Central Florida to Atlanta is now a seven or $800 lane, you know, almost double what it's been 
for the last 20 years, it's uh, it's pretty eye opening. And so, um, I, yeah, when you look at it and when you're not you're aware of it, but you're not involved in it as closely, uh, it's 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 eye opening to see those changes. And I think we're all benefiting from that right now. Uh, I don't know if it will last forever. In fact, it won't. But I, I do hope that at least a new a new baseline is being set right now. I, I hope and I think for those that run assets, that new baseline needs to be because we can't continue to stay on this roller coaster like, all right, 2018, best year ever. Yeah. 2019, we lost our ass. You know, it's like we can't it's it, you can't run that roller coaster. It's so hard to do. Um, and, you know, I, there's a lot of factors that drive that. But um, it's it's interesting to see. We're going to try to take advantage of it while we can. And, and when we price things for our customers on the asset side, we always focus more on a cost up basis. We're not really I mean, we understand the market, but what is our cost to run that lane? And then we need to make a, a fair profit. Um, and I do think that some of these rates are just outrageous. When you look at what it what it actually costs to run that lane, the, some of the rates are outrageous. Uh, but if we can get them, great. Uh, you know, I don't know how long that's going to last. Right. So Mark had agreed if uh, we had extra time, which we do have about five minutes, it, it wanted to open it up to the floor if anyone had a question and wanted to pick Mark's brain. I don't. Um, you know, I, I think we've, um, we're seeing rates, you know, continue to go up. You know, we, we've priced some bids here in the last, uh, uh, last two months. And, you know, we're now looking at the rates where we're having to commit to those contracted bids, especially on the brokerage side, one of our largest customers. And they're adamant that if we're going to commit to this bid this year, when we tender you the lane, we need you to cover it. And we're looking at it from where we priced it two months ago. And not, not that it's gone up hugely, but it's another 100, 125 bucks, 150 bucks. And, you know, a lot of times that 150 bucks is our, was our margin in that lane. So um, it's, it's, I don't think it's done yet, but I can't imagine it's going to go much higher. And who knows? I mean, um, we may start seeing some softness. I mean, it, you've, we've seen the load tender. Uh, acceptance rates uh, go, uh, or rejection rates come down on a lot of dry vans over the last month to two months. So uh, I do think it's starting to soften a little bit, but uh, even just in the last two months, I mean, largest customer and, you know, we're kind of grinning and bearing it. We're going to go, we had a couple of rates that we needed to adjust, but we know going in that we're going to lose some money on some lanes because we don't want to go back with this wholesale pricing adjustment when we just submitted the bid two months ago. But we've we've seen some pretty significant, uh, again, 100 bucks, but it's, 100 bucks is a lot of money when you're only making 150, so. But, but you know, 2,500 plus dollar averages now, $100, like you said, it's not a whole lot of money anymore, right? When it was 1,500 a year ago on that same lane or whatever yeah. it was. Yep. Um, I do agree <laughs> with your statement earlier on the baseline will change. It will never go back. I mean. I've been doing this for a long time, not probably as long as you have, but, you know, after Katrina, we saw the rates go up and then they fell right back down again. 19, again, like you said, they fell right back down again. I think the baseline's reset now. I absolutely do. And happy for you guys' as assets. I mean, yeah. no, I mean, $50, $400 was not good. Yeah, it, it's, um, it's a big change. The, um, and, again, I, I think from an asset perspective, yeah, we want to continue to drive efficiency and, you know, eliminate deadhead miles and all these other things. But there's only so many things you can do. And it's, um, it's eye-opening. You know, the, the asset side of the business, since we've owned it, and we've, I mean, we got a T-shirt and a tattoo from that one. It's been tough. I mean, we're, we brought it in large, we bought it in large part to complement the growth of our brokerage. Brokerage is 90% of our revenue, so it's, uh, it's the core business. But the assets are critically important and it's done a lot to enable us to grow deeper and wider within uh, uh, certain customers that want the assets but at the end of the day it it's tough when you see these rates come down come down come down and and you're sitting there knowing you're losing money hauling that freight um, it's easier to do on the brokerage side 
Uh, but the I think the, the assets has taught us a lot on the brokerage, and you know we've gotten better in, in a lot of in a lot of ways that way. So. This will be our final question. Thanks, Mark. Um, you know we're talking about the rate gap um, previously. Have there been instances where you've had to go back to your customers where you had contract rates in place and propose an increase this year? Um, and if so, kind of, you know, how have y'all approached that? Yeah, um, we've actually not had to do, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> it seems like, you know, it's a Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, usually we give them Monday off, um, but it's been nonstop. I mean, we've had contract rates in place with some of our largest in particular brokerage customers, but I would also say what we've done, so I'll take the brokerage first and I'll talk about the assets second. On the brokerage side, we've had to go back to them multiple times, oftentimes, because the rates to, to the purchase rates just kept going like this. So, and as you know, it's usually not, hey, I need this rate increase, and they go, okay, no problem. It usually takes two weeks to get that rate increase in place and get it approved, and then they come back to us, and by the time we get it, we're losing money again. So that was what we went through in the second half of 2020. Uh, we've really tried to stay uh, laser focused on it. And again, the other part of it is we've used this contribution mar margin model on the brokerage side to say, look, we're going to calculate what we think our margin in, is on these lanes. And we're not going to go below that, that contribution margin plus some applicable number to cover our sales team and overhead expenses. So. Um, that's what we've done on the brokerage and again going to them. It's really mostly Market-based data. We're trying to share with them what we're paying. You know, we're being a little bit transparent What we're paying what we're seeing in the market what our margins are uh, how much we're losing we're we're, use, we're sharing our contribution margin uh, Numbers with the customer so they understand what what we're doing for them You know we we live by that principle of if you do something for free for a customer don't make sure they know about it you know, if you're giving up money, losing money, make sure they know you're losing money. So those are the things that we've done on that side. On the asset side, it's been more, uh, we try to do like six months, and depending on what's cha changing in our cost structure, uh, we know exactly kind of where we need to be in terms of a rate increase. So like when we went for the uh, $2 base increase to our driver group going into 2021, we had to get ahead of that and get customer buy-in on rate Rate, in, rate increases, and then with the new change that we're going with that we're rolling out this week, we've already started that process with our customers. We've been in front of probably 80 percent of, of them at this point, and we've explained it in detail. Here's what we're doing. This is the impact to the driver. This is why we're doing it for you guys. Uh, this is the benefit to you guys as a customer. Uh, and you know, we talk through all the components: the the trailer costs, the uh, fa uh, driver, uh, the tractor costs, driver costs, insurance costs, and we basically break it all down to them. And, and we, we probably uh, at times are overly transparent with our customers when, when it comes to those types of costs, uh, because we want them to know. You know, it's it's kind of hard to argue with data, and so we just kind of give them the data and show it to them. Yeah, I, I at. I mean, knock on wood, the best I can do right now. We've, everybody, we started with our largest customers first, in particular on the asset side. And at this point in time, we've gotten everything approved. Uh, no, no real pushback to speak of. They understand where we're coming from. And, um, you know, what we're doing with them is working a little bit. We were trying to get everything in place by October 1, uh, because that's when we're going to roll out the driver pay increase. But we've had a couple of customers say, you know, for budget purposes, would you mind deferring to January or, you know, whatever. So we'll give them a little bit of lead time on the, on the timing of it. And then the other thing we've kind of done is said, look, it's a minimum, minimum of a six-month six look back. So at, we're going to look at these rates with you guys every six months, and hopefully we won't see any significant changes. So we, we schedule those out, make sure every six months – we're sitting down with that customer and, and at least saying, look, we've looked at everything, no change needed right now, but you know, we're going to extend these out for another six. Or if there's, a, if there's a change needed, it's a whole lot easier to go after a 2 or 3% increase than a 15% increase. So 
you know, we just try to stay in front of them as, as regularly as we can uh, to, uh, to make that an easier process. Well, thanks, Mark. I really appreciate it. And thank you all uh, for listening in. Uh, I think we all learned a lot. And good luck with the rest of the year. Stay safe. And enjoy the rest of the show, everybody. Thanks. Thank you.